we talked about value material. We talked about meaning, like a text that's transcribed. We talked about context. Then I would say also um, I would describe something as, for lack of a better word, the experience of the work. And here's one place where I probably have a disagreement about the 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 sort of uh, fetish that many, um, especially in the art world, uh, 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 people have for the original material. And that's where, um, just to give one of many examples, um, uh, Dan Flavin, an artist of the 60s and 70s, created uh, amazing uh, installations with fluorescent bulbs. And he always used the same standard bulbs that you could buy at any Home Depot or you know hardware store. Uh, there were about uh, four colors of white and about four co other colors that you could choose, um, one of which was a cherry red. And it turned out that eventually that red became um, extinct. The cadmium or whatever heavy metal dyes that were used to create it were too toxic. The, the um, government stepped in and said, you can't manufacture those anymore, so you can't find those bulbs anymore. And yet the, a lot of the sort of excitement of his work was the idea that there was this off-the-shelf technology that you could go down and buy for yourself for you know, 10 bucks at your local hardware store that he managed to create these luminous installations from where it really uh, washed the, the, the walls of whatever gallery you were in in amazing color. So what do you do now? Well, you know, um, the, the, there are many options, but um, one of the, I think, worst ideas is to say, well, Flavin made this particular sculpture, and here is the light bulb fixture. Even though it doesn't go on anymore, it doesn't light anything, light up anything, this is uh, so important that it's the original material that we're going to keep that, and that's what we're going to collect. Yes. And I did, I did hear from someone uh, who had gone into a collector's home and saw an unlit Flavin in the corner, and said, what's that? And I said, oh, that's my Flavin. That's my sculpture. Interesting. Uh, you, you, you know, you get this kind of uh, debate also in the historic preservation community uh, where they're preserving uh, buildings or sites and so forth, where, which cannot be preserved forever using any technology. So, you know, they've uh, developed the idea that you build it uh, as close to the original specs as possible. Uh, you rebuild a site. Uh, so it looks the same, it was built the same, it uses the same technology. And uh, one case I know of, they, uh, the, they were making the argument that you know, redoing an adobe building in California, that, the, that you had to make it uh, using donkey urine because that was the original uh, formula for adobe, and, and as though anyone could make any difference. <laughs> anyone could tell Maybe the, the difference. smell. <laughs> yeah, well, m uh, it evaporates, so I, I don't think anyone ever noticed, but, um, but th this was insisted upon uh, that it had to be made in this manner. It wasn't authentic. Hmm, that's um, interesting. You know, and that, that sort of brings me to, you know, two of, the, two of the critical issues from an archival perspective in, in preservation is that you can, that you, can, well, the way archivists often put it is that you have to be able to uh, uh, maintain the the um, authenticity and integrity of documents, and what uh, what they mean by authenticity is quite simply that a document is what it says it is, uh, and integrity is that it hasn't been you know altered over time um, since it was created. Uh, however, in the this is used oftentimes in institutional archives where they have custody of a material almost, almost you know, very shortly after it was created. So, so they are the safeguard, you know, they are the guardians of that authenticity and integrity. When you're looking backwards in time and taking, you know, our classic uh, uh, collection of tablets, then you really have to get derive that from context. And uh, in the after the Middle Ages, I guess, I guess during the Renaissance, the 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 uh, field of diplomatics developed to to authenticate uh, certain kinds of documents, mainly uh, um, uh, certificates of nobility, which were being widely forged by um, wealthy merchants who believed they should be noblemen. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the things they determined was that if a document is part of a series, which what I was just talking about earlier. If it's part of a, a series, um, and they're particularly if they're uh, 
sequentially numbered series or they're no, or they're arranged by date, uh, it becomes very hard to to forge a particular document and slip it in to a series because the handwriting will be different, uh, the number won't fit, um, you know something will be something will be out of sync and it will be identified as a forgery. So that you know that's one of the one of the lessons is that that you know you'd have to um, forge the entire series of documents in order, to, right. <laughs> and no one do, no one does that. Sort of a, sort of an analog checksum in a way. It, it is it, it, exactly. It's an analog checksum, which is a, a way of, of of checking of adding up the bits inside a a, a digital file to see if um, it's the same as some file that it came from. Uh, was copied from. Well, not to jump too quickly into the digital, but as we move to the contemporary world where technologies have an ephemerality that's just f frenetically, you know, accelerating, can we still keep that idea of, well, let's make sure that it has integrity, and by that you mean you don't change it. Right. It seems to me like everything around us is changing all the time, and it's very difficult to imagine uh, a contemporary medium where you wait 10 years and it hasn't changed in some way. Right. Well, you know, I brought this example from my, my personal collection. This is a uh, cylinder recording from, oh, pro let's see, what's the date? Probably about 1920. Nice. It's a uh, Edison uh, Blue Amberol, um, and they were commercially produced. Uh, uh, and cylinder uh, players were common at the time as record players became later. Um, however, within about 10 years of this, Record players had overtaken, uh, overtaken the uh, market, and um, well, now how many of you have something to play this on at home? Not many, I'm, I'm guessing. So there's a issue of technology obsolescence in anything that's been made from a machine, uh, or that's machine readable in any form. Um, so then you have to migrate it to a form that can be read. And there's always going to be a debate, uh, I think, um, in, among preservationists about how much you can change in that process. Um, and, and that sort of brings us into the digital world because you can never, you know, you can never completely uh, migrate something without some, some alteration. Right. I think that's the whole point of migration. But when, you, when we talked before about, again, dividing up what it is you're going to preserve, what are the goals, preserving, you know, again, the material, the context, the meaning, and the experience. I'm wondering if this is a case where, uh, you know, someone might prioritize one of these and then let other, you know, try to keep one of them more constant and then change others um, more drastically in order to achieve the goal. So let's say that your goal was, you know, I'm really interested in this amber cylinder and, you know, that's what's exciting to me. You might make one choice, but if you're interested in the sound, you might mm. make another. And perhaps, you know, if we go back to that idea of the experience, would you have to reproduce the cracky kind of fuzzy sound of a wax cylinder where you can, you know, you hear the kind of rotation of the cylinder as part of the, the music or voice recording? Yeah, well, you phrased several, <laughs> several issues. I think uh, if, you, if you preserve this without this, you know, just as an artifact, Sort of like using your refrigerator to store shoes in, it, it's it's you know doesn't really get to the original purpose. Um, it still has a use. You can put this on your mantelpiece, and it's a n nice decoration, um, but it doesn't you know doesn't really tell you what was being communicated with it at the time. Uh, I wouldn't consider that preservation uh, from an archival perspective. Um, so what you know. What would an uh, what would an archi archivist do? I, I would say one of two things: they either keep an Edison recorder player available to play those things, and or they uh, record it onto a newer medium from which it can be played. And uh, they w in the preservation recording they would uh, they would not filter out any of the crackly sounds because that's part of, that's part of the re you know replaying experience, but they might filter it out for a user copy to be listened to. Mm -hmm. So there's different kind of contexts. I mean, I think, every, you know, we can imagine a whole spectrum of, of interventions. Um, and and in, in, in the world of museums, the, the common, um, you know, kind of lay perception of conservation, what conservators do when they, you know, uh, 
uh, repair a painting or re recreate an installation or something is, is have as little intervention as possible. It's sort of like the doctor that doesn't want to right. do surgery. But in fact, um, w I, I believe that when you do, when you don't intervene in one area, you usually end up intervening in another area. So it's really a question more of where do you put your, your emphasis? Where do you put your intervention? So in the case of, of, of let's go back to the Gettysburg Address, um, my understanding uh, from reading a little of the history is that most people in the audience couldn't hear it. There was something else going on on stage. I can't remember. They were There was right. a band or they were uh, kind of, they didn't realize that his speech had started because the other one went mm -hmm. so long. You know, he was uh, preceded by an orator who spoke for over two hours and um, his was two minutes. Uh, so a lot of people were like, well, when is Lincoln going to give his talk? Boom, it was gone. So you know, that's obviously um, an aspect of the experience that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily intend you to, uh, or would, wouldn't think that that's preserving. But, you know, maybe the, the most real experience would actually be to have a whole crowd of people talking while you're trying to listen to Lincoln's speech. <laughs> right, except that probably the main impact of the speech was it being recorded in newspapers in a textual form and right. people re responding to it in, in that form. Um, That's right. There's this claim that, that Lincoln was like the Twitter king of his day, right? He, he used whatever the social media at the time was, namely, you know, uh, the teletype in order to, uh, to uh, the telegraph to, to, you know, kind of broadcast messages across so, this vast state of the Union. So he spoke in brief uh, sound bites that were, that had a good... Uh, what was it, 10 words? How many, how many yeah. words could you do on a, on a telegraph, know. right? It was pretty short. Telegraph ease, it's called. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they used emoticons. I actually think there was some news story about Lincoln including an emoticon in one of his speeches. But anyway, to go on to this idea of experience, um, I think a, 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 a kind of, to our eyes, perhaps radical version of that, uh, but very sensible for another culture, is the story of the Japanese temples that are simply uh, allowed to decay, and when they get to a certain point, they are re rebuilt from scratch. Um, with presumably the same materials. I don't know if they use donkey urine. I suspect not. But uh, the notion is that the, the, what we want you to experience is not some erratic material, you know, the actual atoms that were present when, you know, a samurai, you know, walked in the temple, but more of uh, the experience that they would have of this fresh new building that had been built. So there's another, you know, kind of valuation of the experience over the material. Sure, I guess that would be the same argument for taking all the coal stains off of 19th century buildings because when they were new, they were they didn't look the way they do now. Right. But, but, which, would, but which conveys to us a meaning that they're old and from that period. And right. So it's like the um, when you see movies and people or, or a reenactment and you see this kind of very uh, kind of yellowed parchment, right, that people yeah. are using. Whereas parchment, when it comes out, is perfectly white. It just yellows right. over time. It's, they wouldn't have seen this... <laughs> yellowed, curled parchment. Well, and indeed, some papers don't do that. Good, high-quality rag paper doesn't yellow like that. Uh, and, see, there's the archivist talking. And, yeah, it's mainly the pulp paper made from, um, you know, from trees that, that does that. When they were hand-making paper with rags, it was, it lasted much better 